During the First World War, thousands of women from all across Newfoundland volunteered their time, energy, and expertise to help Allied forces overseas and to boost morale at home. They raised enormous sums of money. They made and shipped clothing, medical supplies, and other goods to troops overseas. At home, they visited families who had sons, brothers, fathers, or husbands on the front lines. And they volunteered in local hospitals. A single organization spearheaded almost all of these activities. It was called the Women's Patriotic Association, or the WPA for short. Over the course of the war, it mobilized about 15,000 volunteers from across the Dominion, and it established branches in more than 200 communities. The WPA also collaborated with international groups like the Red Cross and the St. John's Ambulance Association. Much of the WPA's work remained firmly planted in the traditionally female spheres of caregiving, fundraising, and domestic work, like knitting and sewing jobs which had been largely taken for granted in the past, but which the WPA proved were of tremendous economic and social significance. Its prolific and meaningful contributions to the war effort forever changed the way that society perceived women's roles. Lady Margaret Davidson founded the WPA in the summer of 1914. She wanted to form a group that could send care packages to troops serving overseas and look after their wives, children, and other dependents still living at home. That this is a unique time when we are required to make personal sacrifices such as we never thought or dreamt of before, there can be no doubt. It is the best we can do for those who are enduring daily hardships and giving their health and strength for our beloved empire. We have received an appeal from the St. John's Ambulance Association asking for things for the sick and wounded and they sent a list of things required which comprise shirts, cotton and flannel, not flannette, bed jackets, pajama sleeping suits, pillows, pillow slips and old linen, not old clothes. Now I feel sure we women in Newfoundland can help in this way with our work as well as in other ways and we shall do so best and most effectively if we join together and cooperate. To do this, I consider that we shall do best to organize ourselves into an association. WPA branches sprang up across the island. Any woman aged 16 or older could join. The association was unique in its ability to break down the class and religious barriers that had divided Newfoundland society for generations. Its volunteers included the very wealthy and the very poor. They came from outport communities and from urban centers, and they belonged to almost every religious denomination that existed in the Dominion. An exception to this rule was the group's executive members. They came from the Dominion's richest and most distinguished families. The branch presidents were usually the wives of doctors, merchants, or ministers, or they were school teachers, well-educated, respected, and well-off. One year after the association formed, its secretary, Eleanor McPherson, outlined its rapid progress. They are now fully organized and working along lines very much the same as we have adopted in St. John's, 168 branches. In very few cases have there been any divisions, but dropping all distinctions of a social or religious nature, the women have joined hands to work for the men at the front. It has been estimated, not by the society, but by someone rather good at figures, that there are something over 15,000 women in Newfoundland who are doing their bit. Inspiring, is it not? One of the WPA's central goals was to provide Newfoundland and Labrador soldiers with comforts from home. Chocolate and tobacco were important treats, but clothing made up the bulk of most WPA care packages. The women spent countless hours knitting mittens, sweaters and scarves, and sewing flannel shirts, pajamas and other clothes. But it was the WPA's grey wool socks that became its most sought-after item. The socks quickly became an icon of wartime Newfoundland. Troops, like Private Frank Lind of the Newfoundland Regiment, praised them in the letters they sent home. The Newfoundland sock is the best sock in the world, and it is prized by every soldier. How many times at the peninsula, and before we ever saw Egypt, have regiment soldiers asked if we had a pair of Newfoundland socks to give or sell them? All across Newfoundland, the knitters and sewers of the WPA sent shipment after shipment of clothing overseas. The British War Office distributed the goods to the Newfoundland Regiment first and then gave any surplus supplies to other British forces. The WPA was prolific in its work. 
By 1916, it had produced 62,000 pairs of socks, 9,000 shirts, 6,000 pairs of gloves, and 2,400 scarves. But that wasn't the only thing it did. The group engaged in a wide range of other activities, too. Its volunteers visited families who had soldiers or sailors fighting overseas. Their most important tasks were to comfort the people whose relatives had appeared on the casualty lists and to visit troops recovering in local hospitals. By the end of 1916, the WPA's volunteers had made more than 4,500 visits to homes and hospital beds. They also welcomed and entertained any Allied troops who arrived on the island. In 1916, the WPA helped to open a Soldiers and Sailors Club in downtown St. John's. That was followed by a second military club two years later. It was known as the Caribou Hut. The association was also a powerful fundraiser. It published the Distaff newspaper to raise money for the Red Cross and to publicize the work that women were doing during the war. WPA volunteers also sold calendars, Christmas stamps, flowers, and other goods. They organized music concerts, hockey games, and other events, and they installed collection boxes all over St. John's to solicit donations from passers-by. By the end of the war, the group had collected more than $500,000. That's worth about $6.5 million today. It was a staggering amount from such a small dominion. Only about 250,000 people lived in Newfoundland and Labrador, and many of them were poor. The WPA also provided important medical services during the war. It partnered with the Red Cross to make bandages, surgical dressings, swabs, and other medical supplies. The group later expanded its mandate to include hospital comforts like pillows, pajamas, and dressing gowns. All of this was shipped overseas to Europe's crowded military wards. Hospital necessaries made here were used in France, Malta, and Egypt, also on hospital ships carrying the wounded from Calais to Southampton and from Alexandria to England, and a personal letter to Miss Hewitt from her sister mentioned that she was using some of the Newfoundland dressings in a large military hospital 500 beds in England, and they all remarked how excellently they were prepared. War zone hospitals also received money and equipment from the WPA. The group's cot fund put desperately needed beds in military wards in Europe. The fund was such a success that money from it helped to open a Newfoundland ward at a military hospital in France. Private Philip Jensen became the public face of the Cot Fund. He was wounded so badly in the Battle of Ypres that he was sent home to Newfoundland in 1916. He began to travel the island, telling his war stories and eventually raising more than $4,000. The Red Cross branch of the WPA used some of that money to open Jensen Camp, a 17-bed hospital in St. John's that treated servicemen suffering from tuberculosis. In 1917, the WPA also opened a naval and military convalescent hospital at the Waterford Hall in St. John's. The hospital treated more than 350 men during its three-year existence. The group also helped to recruit volunteer nurses. It encouraged single women to serve in military wards overseas and asked married women and retired nurses to volunteer at local hospitals. They recommended that the women work half-day shifts seven days a week. Women who did not have any nursing experience could take classes with the St. John's Ambulance Association. Professional nurses were also kept busy. Like Emma Reed, she was a graduate of the General Hospital's School of Nursing. When the war broke out, she applied to serve in military hospitals overseas, but was rejected for medical reasons. So she stayed in St. John's to nurse returning soldiers. When a measles epidemic broke out among the Newfoundland Regiment's new recruits in 1916, she worked long hours to treat them. Later, she became the head nurse of the Military Infectious Diseases Hospital on Military Road. Reed's work earned her the Royal Red Cross Medal it recognizes exceptional services in military nursing in the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth. By the end of the war, many women in Newfoundland and Labrador had witnessed great suffering and hardship. They had also made very public and very significant contributions to the war effort. They received high praise from politicians, the press, and public figures, like this letter from the Deputy Colonial Secretary Arthur Muse. The ladies of the WPA certainly have established a record for administrative ability in relation to the running of the hospital at Waterford Hall, and the unselfish service which they have rendered in this connection will not be forgotten by the 350 men who were treated there, 
nor by the Department of Militia, who were so greatly aided by your work. The war has brought out the fact that no more faithful, zealous, and effective workers were to be found than the ladies of the various volunteer organizations who did so much, especially in connection with the nursing of the wounded and sick. In 1918, King George V awarded the prestigious Order of the British Empire to nine members of the WPA for their contributions to the war effort. The association had demonstrated that women's traditional roles, such as caregiving and knitting, were of tremendous economic and social importance. It had also helped to redefine women's roles by adding a public dimension to their traditional work. Its members had learned how to organize in groups, manage large sums of money, speak in public, identify social problems, and work towards a solution. All of this played an important role in their political development. When the war ended, many of the women who had assumed leadership roles in the WPA adopted a new mission, to win voting rights for women. Former WPA leaders like Armin Gosling and Fanny McNeil helped to form the Women's Franchise League in 1920. As a result of their efforts, women finally won their right to vote and run for political office in 1925. The WPA remained active in the first few years after the war. Instead of caring for soldiers, it turned its attention to child and maternal health care. It reopened Waterford Hall as a children's hospital, and it created the Child Welfare Committee to provide free milk to all infants. As a result of this work, the child death rate dropped significantly in Newfoundland. The association dissolved in 1921. Its work was largely taken over by the newly formed Child Welfare Committee. But the WPA would re-emerge 18 years later to coordinate volunteer work for the Second World War. In 